if you don't grieve and if you don't process your grief, then your grief will process you. The difference is when you process your grief, you have more control. When you let it process you, you have no control. And so it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen at all, then you find yourself limping through life. And I don't want to limp through life. Uh, I told him I would do the Emmaus walk this year. I missed the last time because Bethany was uh, was in the uh, hospital. I couldn't leave her. And so they told me to walk was. And I was talking to Robbie O'Quinn, and he said uh, it's going to be the the fifth through the seventh of April. So, so Sunday is going to be our last day. It's going to be April seventh, and it hit me. And I said, "That's Bethany's birthday." And he said, "He said." So you sure you want to go? I said, I, yeah. Bethany loved the mass, and I would not. It is, I look at this as a birthday present for her. Yes, I'll be there. That she'd want me there. That's right. And so there's no way I'm gonna mess it for that, you know. But again, you gotta grieve. So, so uh, uh, I was helping somebody last week that just lost their child, their, their adult child, and so it just, it's just it's everywhere. It's happening everywhere, all over the place. Just sometimes you're not exposed to it. But just know it's there and it's happening all over the place. So remember, don't be, don't think you're going to burden me or overwhelm me by bringing me problems. And if you want to talk or get some, get some counsel or whatever, do not feel like you're aggravating me or you're putting me out. Because remember, uh, when I'm helping you, I'm helping myself. Okay, that's the cool thing about being a Christian. When you help somebody else, you're helping yourself. And so, so it just helps me to, to, to kind of. Clear my mind and get past that stuff too. God's good. Yeah, I can't stop saying it. I just can't stop. Uh, uh, turn to the book of Judges. Stand for the ring of the word. I'm going to run through the first part real fast. But just in case somebody wasn't here, I'm gonna, I just put up a few slides, just a few. Then we're going to go into the day stuff. And, and, and it's amazing what God can do if you let him. Amen? If you let him, it is so amazing. What he will, not just can do, but will do. So, uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against him, and they kept against him and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come to Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ass nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came up as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy. Whenever I see this, all I can think of is, how many times do we get in trials and we find out that, that, that we're overwhelmed with what's happening around us? This is what's going on. Y'all say overwhelmed. overwhelmed. They were totally overwhelmed. They couldn't even work. They couldn't do anything. They were so overwhelmed with the problems. And there's a lot of us many times that we can't keep our mind on what we're doing. Uh, and even me, I, like, like I was supposed to go preach in the church tonight. And, 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 and uh, uh, they asked me a couple weeks ago and I said, let me make sure there's nothing going on. And I'll call, I'll, I'll text you back. And as far as I know, I text them back. And I was going today, it was in uh, uh, Brother Pollock's church, I was going today. And so I texted him yesterday and said, well, tell me what the dress code is. And you know, we're going to be in the church or we're going to be in the fellowship hall or where. And he said, I'm sorry, brother, you never text me back. And they wound up getting somebody else. And I said, you sure I didn't text you back? And he said, no, you didn't text me back. And see, again, they, they, the, 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 the error hit him. With the, with the grieving cycle. So it's okay. If you're feeling kind of like an airhead, you're going through something, it's okay. Because God will lead you and guide you through it. And, and like I said, I'm not only the president of the club, I'm a member. I mean, I'm a member, I'm the president of the club. Amen. So so here we are. Uh, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out forth of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites in whom land, whose land you dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat uh, under an oak, which is an Ophrah, 
that pertained unto Joash, uh, Abensonite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and the Lord said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of violence. We'll stop it right there. Father, <clears throat> I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. <clears throat> I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, you're alive and well and on the throne. God, I give this day to you in a very powerful way. Lord, I just give it to you. Lord, we all give it to you because, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. With you, we can do all things. I ask you, Lord, to bring this word to life, illuminate our minds, illuminate our spirits. In the name of Jesus, we love you and we thank you for it. And the church said, Amen. 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 Way down, tell somebody, you're so glad to be in the house of God within today. And now listen, now don't forget, look around. If you see some people that don't see some people you normally see, make sure you call them, not to bless them out. If you're going to call them to bless them out, I pray God turn your phone off. Okay? But all of this time you missed them, don't get in a great big discussion about anything. Just ask one you to know that we missed you and you do make, your presence does make a difference. That's all you got to do. Amen? All right. So here we go. <clears throat> Uh, uh, this is from Gideon. I'm just going to go through it quickly, the, the first part here. Gideon, of course, is a, is a mighty example <clears throat> of what God can, how God can take a look. Let's look now, this, i got to stop here for just a second, though. He considered himself a nobody. He had an inferiority complex. He ran, which meant he was being led by fear, and he hid, which means he had a victim mentality. But God took all of that and turned it around and did something very special with this man. It's amazing what God can do if you'll trust him. Amen? So, so what Gideon could only see is that they were under attack and it looked like God was silent. So because he thought God was being silent, he even didn't even pray to him. Let me stop right there. He didn't even pray. Have you been so overwhelmed with problems that you even forgot to pray? Or... God became a lifeboat to you instead of a instead of a mission ship. He was a lifeboat, and you just wanted him when, when you needed him. So, so, so again, uh, uh, he's depending on himself, and he's hiding. Does this sound familiar? You may not be hiding physically, but mentally and emotionally, you're hiding. You don't want to be around people. You want to keep yourself hid from everybody, out of sight. Now, that's what's going on when you get under attack if you don't give it to God. So here it is, real quick. Uh, he said, but Lord, uh, uh, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. I mean, my family is a nobody, and I'm the least of my family. I'm the nobody of my nobody family. Have you ever felt like that? So, so when you live by fear, you'll be led by fear, and you'll leave, leave others your fear. So, again, here it goes, and they're getting ready to jump in. Uh, uh, when tough times come, instead of looking at them as if God is punishing you, try to see them as God's gift of grace. I was studying this week, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll put up some of the slides of some of the things I've been studying. Uh, I get amazed. Uh, as, as I'm so glad that I went to Lee University. Uh, of course, Liberty would have been a good one, too, but I'm glad I went to Lee uh, because they, the first, the first college that Linda went to university years ago before I started, uh, she went to a Christian, supposedly a Christian university, but it was kind of, it didn't seem like it. Even when she took New Testament survey, it didn't seem like it was, as a matter of fact, it seemed like it was very liberal. And I told Linda, I said, you don't need to listen to some of this stuff. You might want to answer questions for your test, but don't get this stuff out of your spirit. And, uh, of course, she left that place, and now she's in Lee. But, but again, God, we can't, we, if you listen to the prosperity gospel and tough times come, you think it's because you don't have enough faith. Uh, I hear a whole lot on TV about stay in faith, stay in faith. Don't let go of your faith because your faith will get you through to keep all the tough times away. My faith is not a band-aid. And my faith is not some kind of ward-off spray to keep bad things from happening. My faith and your faith is there to help us get through the tough times. Amen? When things do happen, because life is life and we have to be able to handle it. Okay? So a lot of times when things are coming our way, don't think God is punishing you. God can be doing a work on you that you never could have had any other way. Uh, again, hard times are like washing machines. They twist and turn and knock us around, but in the end, we come out cleaner, brighter, and better than before. And again, this here we go. We're getting ready to jump. Y'all ready to get, get into it? I'll just go ahead and quickly put this up here. Actually, all we see is the present. All we, God uses tough times to bring us out. 
get our attention. He uses it to direct us up to see him and direct us out to bring out the good in us. Y'all say this with me. Watch this. My trouble didn't happen to me. Say it. My trouble happened for me. That's hard to say sometimes. Let's say it one more time. Maybe you can get deep down inside. Ready? My trouble didn't happen to me. It happened for me. If God is controlling it, and God's got his hand on it, then, and he allowed it, guess what? It didn't happen to me. It happened for me. There's a greater good in the end than all of this. Uh, okay? So now, remember this. Uh, God sees more than we do. All we, he sees the day and the mark at the same time. All we can see is our present conditions and ask how and why. And God looks uh, from the past, present, and future all at one time. And he says, why not? So, so here it is. God confirms it with his presence, of course. Uh, he said, I'll be with you, Gideon. You're going to take these guys on as easy as if they were only one man. They were so far, he couldn't even, he couldn't even number the, the troops against him. And he said, you're going to take them on as if they're one man. So as long as we're standing still or moving backwards, don't expect God's powerful presence. A lot of us want God's powerful presence before we move forward. And God says, if you move forward, then I'll show you my presence. So when we advance, when we move by being spectators, we are never alone. Now, here we go. Here, I'll say it, y'all. Gideon and his fleece. Not fleece, fleece. Amen. Did you hear about that? <laughs> Did you hear about the guy who brought his, brought his dog to the, to the uh, flea circus? <laughs> he stole the show. Okay, it's going down quick. I'm not going anymore. <laughs> Get it. He took his dog out and the fleas were on the dog, so he stole the show. Okay. <laughs> if I've got to explain him, it's already lost all his fervor, okay? Oh, you yeah, have it. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Here, here, here we go. <laughs> get your Bible turn to turn turn to, to chapter six, verse thirty-three. We're getting ready to get into some fresh territory. Ready? Verse thirty-three. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. And Abizar uh, came and talked to me. I praise God. Abizar was gathered after him, and he sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh, who also gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali. And they came to meet him. And Gideon said unto God, now look, he's, looking at, now he's blowing the trumpet to get the guys up here, like God said, but he's looking out and he sees all these people as far as he can see. There's all these nations, not just one. All these nations are against him. And so he goes, and God, and Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I'll put a fleece of wool on the floor, and the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry on the earth beside. Then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. How many knows that your faith does not mature overnight? can. We can, get, we can get all fired up, but actual mature faith does not happen overnight. My faith level right now, I used to think I had a lot of faith. I used to think it was great. And I mean, even with Bethany, when, when they diagnosed Bethany, and they talked about all the treatments that they had now, and, they said, and, and then Linda went on this, this uh, care site where people went on and they had stage four melanoma, and they even said there was people that had lived nine years with these treatments and were still going strong, and some even had no, it wasn't called in remission, it was called no evidence of disease. So there's several people that lived for nine years with no evidence of disease, they were living three, four, five years, and, and but every now and then, and Linda would say, Linda said, you know, I know this, that this is some super drugs here and all this, she said, but I just got this feeling in my gut. And I said, well, I had that feeling too, but I, I'm going to let my faith override my feeling. And I believe God's going to do something. She said, well, I'm not going to doubt that God can do something, but I still have this feeling in my gut that, that, that she's not going to last nine years. 
And, and so I said, well, how long is she going to last? We're going to hold on to it until the end. And she said, oh, of course, we're not going to let go. She said, but I just don't have that same feeling you got. And I said, well, it's actually my faith trying to override my feelings. And so, so uh, and then about once a week, Linda would, Linda would tell me on that site where somebody had said, they had to put an RIP and, and thank you for praying for my uncle, my aunt, my mama, my daddy, my kid. Um, they, they actually went to be with God last night and their battle is over. And every time she'd read one of those to me, my gut would just wrench. And I remember going to the hospital and, and I remember seeing her where she couldn't hardly talk and they would shoot her up with some stuff and then she'd be back doing good again and, and, and cutting up and carrying on. And so I kept thinking, you know, God's got, I, kept, I know God's got this, but I kept thinking God was going to allow her at least let her last for a few years. I had no idea that she was going to last eight months. But, but, but again, even though she didn't win the battle here, she won the battle. And it didn't destroy my faith. It actually increased my faith. Even though the hard stuff we went through and I watched her just, you know, just, just, just fade away, it still did not destroy my faith in God. It did not destroy my faith in healing. I do have to admit, though, all these cancer commercials on television, advertising the drugs ever given Bethany, you know, Linda said, Linda just put, put it on mute or change the channel. She says, yeah, it works for some people, but not all. She'll turn it off. And I go, no, we, we're going to have to keep on with this. You know, we're going to have to keep keep moving forward in this. But, but again, I discovered, again, for the millionth time in my life, that God meets us where we are. And he meets us with exactly what we need when we need it. Now, now, now again, remember, it, it's not an overnight thing. It, and 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 up until the, up until the end, I just knew Bethany was going to going to beat this thing. They finally got that great big thing to shrink. And after seven weeks, seven weeks of uh, radiation, it should be five weeks, but with all the stops and starts, it was seven weeks. And I uh, thought that everything was going good, and all of a sudden she woke up one morning, and she was out of it. And she started going way downhill about a week before she fell. And, and I just knew something was up. I knew something was happening. I didn't know that, that a tumor was growing in her brain. And so I did not know that. And, and so, uh, uh, again, though, God met us at every point, every turn. And even though Bethany was, was hurting, uh, she still had a great faith in God. And watching her minister to people, even when she could hardly move, motivated me to know <coughs> that God had her and that she was his message. And she was using him to give a message to people that she could not have given to if she had to be in the shape she was in because we would not have been there. You know, and so... so uh, I actually saw Bethany do more in the last eight months of her life for God than I'd seen her do in a long time. It was amazing the stuff that she was doing and the people that she was ministering to. But again, God meets you where you are and he meets you with what you need. Now, now I've got to remember something here. We, we, there's some people... I hear some people talk about the fleece and they get all excited about the fleece. And I hear some people, they get all mad about the fleece and say, why do you have to have a fleece? Couldn't he trust God? God told him. God sent an angel and, and showed him all this. And why do you have to have a fleece? Well, he looked out and saw all these nations against him. You know, I like to kind of back up too sometimes. Say, God, are you sure? You know, I, I, does that mean I don't have any faith because I said, God, are you sure? Did you really ask me to do this? Did you really? Is this really what we're supposed to be doing? Is this the way to go in this direction? Are you sure? And so, so you got to understand something. God called him to an extraordinary mission. He even did, he had no idea. Once he called the guys, he had 32,000 men to go against an uh, army, nations that were innumerable. There were so many people at the sands of the, uh, sands of the beach. He, these guys are coming at him, and he's got 32,000 men. And so, you know what? I'd like to say I'm super duper walking over Christian, but I think I have a fleece or two. I want to throw something out there and make sure. 
So, so next time you get feeling kind of rough and thinking maybe I maybe I wasn't as strong in faith as I thought I should be. You know, the devil tried to hit me a few times. Say, if you'd been stronger in faith, Beth would still be alive. And I go, no, I don't want to go there. Don't even take me there because we did everything we were supposed to do and everything. I backed up and looked at it and keep looking at it and looking over back and forth. And we gave her every treatment that was possible. But the treatments were worse for her than the cancer itself. And so if she, if she couldn't take the treatments, then how are you supposed to, how you supposed to use those treatments? It was shutting her body down. So, so again, here it is. But God called him to an extraordinary mission. So because God had called him to an extraordinary mission, he needed some help. Because remember, he'd been living in a spiritually impoverished nation. Kind of like us today. A spiritually impoverished nation. He personally didn't have any examples of God's greatness. And he didn't see any around him. All he could say is, if you're so good, God, and if you do like you say you're going to do, why are we having these problems? Why am I hiding to make, make ends meet? Why am I having to hide to just get enough for us to eat? You tell me, God, if because if, if, he had no examples before him. Some of you on here right now, you may be going through something right now, and you don't have any example before you of how to handle it. And so, let me tell you something. Don't think you're being being uh, off the wall to say, okay, God, I need you to talk to me. I need you to show me. I need you to help me, to encourage me. So remember, here he is, he's in a spiritually impoverished environment. Some of us work in a spiritually impoverished environment. And some of you say, well, God, can't you get me out of this environment? Let me tell you something. You're one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons you're because they're spiritually impoverished and need you there to show them something. Amen? So, so, so here we go. He's asking God, he, he says, he puts out, the, puts out the fleece. And see, God knew that he needed extraordinary confirmation because he was getting ready to do an extraordinary work. And so, so it was that he rose early in the morning more and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece in a bowl of water. And Gideon said, God, thank you. Now I know everything's fine. I'm ready to go. Well, God, just in case, let me make sure I got this right. Don't be angry at me. I will speak but this once. Let me prove I'll pray to thee. But this was with the fleece. Now let it be dry only upon the fleece and, uh, and upon the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. So it was dry upon the fleece only and there was dew on the ground. So, so again, what says, this? Can you imagine? This is pretty awesome, actually. You know, I may have lost my patience with the man if I was God. Matter of fact, I've lost my patience with me a many times if I was God. Amen? But he said it twice. And the reason he wanted to find out was he needed to know because what he was going to do was way over his head. I told you I was in a meeting. I was in a meeting the other day, and there was, there was doctors and lawyers, and, and it was for pit attention, and there was doctors and lawyers and psychiatrists, and I was sitting by the sheriff and by a psychiatrist, and, and, and I looked around and saw these people, and, and I... And the first thing, that, first thing that hit me was I am well, well over my head in this group. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that's exactly where I want you. And I said, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you know that. <laughs> but you see, God wants us to step out beyond what we've ever stepped before in order that we can get from him what we've never got before. Amen? So, 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 God is patient with us in the process. This is what Gideon found out. Now watch this. Turn to chapter 7. Just hold your finger there. Look at this, look at this we'll put up here. Sometimes when things are falling apart, they may actually be falling into place. Wow. Sometimes in our life, when it seems like things are falling all to pieces, if we'll be patient and let God do his thing, actually what you think is falling to pieces is God letting everything fall into Somebody say amen. amen. Or oh me. <laughs> All right. 
There it is, chapter 7. This rebel who was Gideon and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, of, of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people there are with thee are too many for me to give you the Midianites. <laughs> well, well, God, wait a minute. I got 32,000 men going against more men than I've ever seen in my entire life. And you're telling me I've got too many men? These Israel fought themselves against me, saying, My own hand to save me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let them return and depart early from the Mount Gilead. And they returned to the people 20 and 2,000, and they remained 10,000. Wow. God was teaching him something. I want you to think about this. Success is not determined, uh, success is not determined by my power. It's determined by God's power. Y'all need to be shouting now. This is a good chance to shout. If you ain't shouted yet, here's your chance. And you say, thank you, God, because I don't have any power. Go ahead. Go on, come on now. Come on. Somebody got to make some noise. Y'all, I need to hear some crazy praise right now. Y'all help me out here. Success is not determined by my power. It's determined by his power. And when you're in over your head, guess what? You don't have any power. Then you've got to depend on his power. All right, so if you've got a problem today that's in over, you're in over your head, and thank God because now you're waiting. And because you're waiting, you don't have anywhere to put your feet. And because you have anywhere to put your feet and steady yourself, you've got to depend on God. Amen? So, the first test, there was 32,000 men, and he said, all those that were afraid, y'all can go on home, and they said, uh, okay. What it was, was he was dividing the faithful from the fearful. He was showing Gideon that he was looking for a warrior spirit. Warrior's attitude. You know, a warrior, even though they're afraid, you know, uh, now I've never charged a heel. Never. With machine guns and all that. I've never done all that. There's been a few times I've charged some heels. Uh, I even went one time, uh, I got a call one time, uh, and this was back before all this new fancy stuff and the SWAT team and all that. This was back uh, in the early 90s. I get a call one night, and a lady calls me and says, you've got to come help me with my brother. And I said, what's wrong with your brother? She said, he's drunk. He's locked himself in the house. He has uh, uh, told us all to go on and said, there's a deputy out here, two deputies out here, and said he's already shot at their car, over the car, and said he's shot over me, and said he's going to kill himself and for us to leave. And he said, I need you to come get him. I said, let me ask this again now. You're saying that he shot at the deputies, and the deputies said, if they go in, they're going to kill him. But didn't nobody wants to do anyway. <laughs> so, then if they go in, they're going to shoot to kill. You can't go because they already shot at you, and you want me to go up there. And my wife said, have you lost your mind? And I said, no, but I, I really think God's calling me to do this. She says, you better believe he is. <laughs> You better hope he is and believe he is. So I pull up to the house, and it's just like they said. There's two deputy cars. I'm not kidding. They're there. They got the lights on. They're behind their car. They got their guns. And nowadays, there'd be a whole bunch of them up there. There'd be SWAT guys and all kinds of stuff. They wouldn't even be playing around. They would be going and take him down. But this is back in the early 90s. The sister's behind her car. And I walk up, and the deputy said, if we go in, we're going to shoot to kill so we're going to give you one chance. And his sister's saying, please give him a chance, please give him a chance, please give him a chance. And so I start walking up, charging the hill. I took my Bible. And it was a thick one, and I held it right there. And I said, Lord, this is my bulletproof vest. I'm guarding my heart. I said, the Lord, this has got to be you, because I, in my right mind, I wouldn't do this. And I walked up and I saw him at the window with his shotgun. And so I said, Lord, I need wisdom a lot right now. And so I knocked on the door and the, and the guy hollered, Preacher, get out of here. I said, I'm not going anywhere. He said, get out of here. I said, I told you I'm not going anywhere. 
opened that door and let me in. He said, I'm not going to open this door. I'm not going to let you in. I'm going to kill myself. And I said, well, just let me in for a minute. And he said, okay. And as he opened the door, he set the shotgun down to open the door. And I saw the shotgun. So when he opened the door, I grabbed the shotgun. He the door said, give me back my gun. And so I opened the shotgun, took the shells out and said, here. And I gave it back to him. He said, what good is that? I said, we're going to go out of here. You need some help, son. We ain't gonna, you can't do this. So then he ran from me, went in the kitchen, took a knife and cut himself. I mean, he about cut his thumb off trying to get away. And so by the time I got him to calm down, he's bleeding. We got, I got his hand wrapped up. We're bleeding. And the, shit, and the deputies come, the sheriff, but the deputies come in with their guns. And they're doing like this. And I said, fellas, you can put them back in the holster. We got this. And I remember that night. Dad, I went off back my wife said, either that was the bravest, most awesome act of faith, or you're just plain stupid. And I said, well, honey, I kind of hope it's the first, not the last. But I remember the anxiousness in my heart. I remember how it felt when I'm going up against the guy with the shotgun, and the deputies wouldn't even go up there at the time. I remember that. And, 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 and the guy told me, he told me, he said, if I ever, after they took him away, he said, if I ever see you again, preacher, I'm going to kill you. And I said, no, you won't. He said, no, really. If I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. They took him off for months. About eight months, six months, eight months, ten months, twelve, I'm not sure, was, uh, more than half a year. I was walking to Walmart one day, and there he was. He was over in the drug section. And I started to walk the other way. No. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that's not how to handle this. Go do it. And again, I didn't have time for a fleece. <laughs> and so I walked up to him. I said, well, one thing about it, there's enough witnesses in here. If he shoots me or whatever he does to me, there's enough witnesses. So I walked up to him and said, I'm not going to be afraid of him. Nothing being terrified of you ever, sir, as you go on in there. So I go in there, and he sees me, and his eyes get that big. And I said, oh, no, here we go. He ran to me and hugged me and pulled me off the ground. He said, thank you so much for what you did. You saved my life that night. I said, you can put me down now <laughs> and save mine. Amen. <laughs> See, again. God's looking for faithfulness. It doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It doesn't mean that you don't have any fear. It just means that your faith will override the fearfulness. These guys charging heels, their, their faith is overriding their fearfulness. So then, the second test. Here we go. This is crazy. You're thinking, when things couldn't get any, any crazier, he said, there remained 10,000. The Lord said unto Gideon, there's still too many. So, so, bring them down to the water, and I'll try them from there. And it shall be that whom I say to thee that I shall go with thee, the same shall be with thee, and of whosoever, whosoever I say to thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought them down to the people to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself, and everyone else that bows down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that laughed, putting their hand in their mouth, were three hundred. But the rest of the people bowed down on their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred of the men that lapped, I will save you. And deliver the Midianites into thy hand. And let all of the people go, every man, into his place. Wait a minute. Thirty-two thousand is too many. And now, you take away a little bit of hat. Now I don't have ten thousand anymore. I've only got three hundred. But see, he was dividing the serious from the not so serious. A warrior, as he's lapping out of his hand, he's looking around to make sure nobody's taking on him, nobody's doing anything. He's, he's patrolling the area with his eyes while he's drinking. He can't be brought, he can't be snuck up on. If somebody's down there drinking water like this, they can be snuck up on. So, so again, he is, watch this, he's, he's 
dividing the serious from the not so serious. Before he was looking for the warrior spirit. Now he's looking for the warrior mentality. I'm going to keep my eyes open. You know, uh, when Daniel first got in the sheriff's office, especially once he started all of a sudden to cover stuff and all this other whatever, God knows whatever, and then when he went to Afghanistan, it got even worse. I couldn't sit down and meal with him without him doing this. I go, what are we looking at, Daniel? He said, well, I've already, I've already found where we can escape if we need to. I'm also looking at everybody. So they go over there. It's a little suspicious. This guy over here, you know, he's supposed to be having a bad day. And I'm going, well, can't we just eat our hamburger? But he got instilled in him. And so he's always looking around, trying to be on the lookout, ready to go. Okay? So remember, watch this. Okay, keep our eyes on Jesus. Watch this. Here it goes. God creates impossible situations in our lives. God creates them. Sometimes Satan does, sometimes we do. But when it's a God created, when God creates impossible situations in our lives to exalt his strength. I think about Bethany, and I think about changing those bandages every day, twice a day, sometimes three times a day. And think about the, the, the trying to get that scent out of the house. And, and, and the Lord just kept giving me stuff that I'd used before in my engineering to fix all this stuff. And it was really cool. And she said, Daddy, Daddy, nurses are cool, but they need engineers to help them. I said, yeah, that's good, Beth. Yes. She said, because you can get the smell out of here. They can't. I said, okay, that's good. I was in over my head. Linda was in over her head. I can't tell you the times that I was here on Sunday morning and got a call as I went way back home, and it was the home health nurse saying, uh, we've called and we're making an appointment. You may have to come on back and take Beth to the cancer center today. And we did that on how many times, and she wound up staying for, for three days, five days, six days. Every day, time they'd say, every time they would say 24 hours, it wound up being five, four, six, seven days. And so, so, so again, it was impossible couldn't fathom it. I could not get it in my mind. But then I thought about it as I was sitting in that cancer center and looked around at other people in other rooms. And then when Bethany was dying, I remember there was this lady come up to me. And I was saying to the Lord, me and the Lord were having a little discussion. I said, Lord, she's only 27. They're telling me now that it's, it's, getting, to the, it's getting to the end. And we're going to have to make a decision soon. This is before Linda had the blood clot. And this lady comes up to me. And she's getting some coffee. And I'm making some coffee. And I said, how are you doing? She said, all right. She says, you got somebody here? I said, yes, my daughter. I said, she's 27. She's sitting over there. She got stage four melanoma. I said, you got somebody here? She said, yes. My son. I said, what kind of cancer is she got? She told me what kind of cancer he says. And she says, he's a neurosurgeon. And the Lord spoke to me and says, cancer don't care. My 27-year-old daughter and a neurosurgeon right down from each other. And she says he's trying to hold on. She says he's been fighting for 12 years. I said, but I'm not sure he's going to make it out of this one. And, and, and it just, again, was overwhelming. But then I, got, I look over and see how other people were handling it. Other people were having problems. One, one the night before, the, the weekend before we've had to tell her she was going to die, I remember there was this black gentleman that was in the room next to her. Sometime in the middle of the night, he died. They took him out. And Cindy Porter was needing to be boosted up. She was fighting cancer. And they put her in his room right next to Bethany. And so I, I'm, I'm taking care of Bethany. I'm walking to get me some coffee. I look over in the room expecting to see this black man who's gone. He's died. And I see Cindy. I said, Cindy, what are you doing here? She said, they told me I had to stay in here to get boosted back up. She said, I'm getting ready to leave in a little while. And by the time she went over to try to talk to Bethany, Bethany was out of it. And I said, you know, uh, she could tell. It was, it, was, it was getting close. And so, so again, sometimes... Things fall apart in your life so that God's strength can be made evident. And that what God does is 
is so strong that you have to depend on him. When Bethany was dying, after I told her she was dying, I said, Bethany, some of y'all have already heard this, I said, Bethany, who do you want to preach your funeral? And it's one of the last things she could actually say. She said, I want you, Daddy, to preach my funeral. And I thought to myself, I don't know how, but it's going to be what she wanted. And I cried all the way up here, cried all the way home, but right there at that moment, God, in his power, I was sitting right there listening, and I was waiting for him to call me up. Brother Paul, I said, God, this has got to be you, because if it ain't you, I'm going to melt right here and fall right down. you got to do something. And as soon as I stepped up, I felt the hands of God lift me right up. You see, our success is not determined by our power. It's determined by God's. And sometimes God will let things be taken away from you. Not to destroy you, but to build your faith. He wants to strip our dependence away on anything other than Him. He always leads us to do what's going to bring Him glory. Remember what He said? If I didn't do this, and you think that you won. So there's 300 men, short story. This is to make it short. BJ, come on up here. Made the story very short. Those 300 men were given, given instructions. They were to take their sword. They were to take a pitcher, a clay pitcher, which was dark, and they were to put a torch in it so you couldn't see it. And they were to gather around a shift change. They were to gather all around all of the all of those guys. 300 men were going to be situated around. And when the horn blew, they were to smash the clay vessels, which would expose the fire. And they would holler the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And when they did that, it confused the guys so bad, they fought their self and were defeated. So Gideon, with 300 men, took on overwhelming odds. Let me ask you something. Are you overwhelmed? Are things taking you to your limit and you're wondering where's God? Everybody stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And nobody looking around, every eye closed. Let me just ask this question. You can put your hand up quickly and put it right back down. Has life been overwhelming lately? Real quickly, just put your hands up in the back there. Now I want everybody to say this. Everybody. This trouble is not happening to me. It's happening for me. Keep on talking now. I'm learning a lesson that I can learn no other way. I thank God that he trusts me enough that as things seem to be falling apart I can trust God that they're falling together I'm also learning that I can't trust my strength but I can always trust his everybody just lift your hands up lift them up Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I know, God, that there's so many things that happen that overwhelm us. We get hit below the bed.